Good evening and thank you for joining us. A high profile murder trial is underway at the Thunder Bay Courthouse. The body of 40 year old Lee Kyoto was discovered on Mission Island in February of 2019. 50 year old David Huey of Thunder Bay and 31 year old Musab Saboon of Kitchener are now on trial for kidnapping and first degree murder. Jonathan Wilson reports. Lee Kyoto was found dead three years ago, his body lying in the snow near the power plant on Mission Island with a single gunshot wound to the back of his head. In the days that followed, Thunder Bay police charged three men with kidnapping and first-degree murder. One of them, 29-year-old Marshall Hardy Fox, later pleaded guilty to the lesser charge of accessory after the fact to murder, and he will now be the Crown's key witness in the murder trial against David Huey and Mossab Saboon. Another key piece of evidence discussed during the first two days of the trial was a surveillance video from a local bowling alley, which shows Kyoto running past the counter. He's then approached by someone matching the description of Saboon, who appears to confront Kyoto and places a hand on his arm while keeping the other hand in the pocket of a sweatshirt. Police believe that's where the suspect was carrying a gun. Kyoto backs away and then follows the suspect out of the bowling alley. On day two of the trial Tuesday, the court was shown video of Saboon being questioned by police before a warrant was issued for his arrest. Saboon pointed out to the investigator that his sweater is a different shade of grey than the one in the video. And Saboon claimed that he and Huey were in southern Ontario when Kyoto was murdered on February 23rd. The trial continues on Wednesday and will last eight days. Jonathan Wilson, TVT News. Another one of the people accused in a 2020 homicide at the Northside Motel has pleaded guilty to manslaughter. The murder happened at the Midtown Inn in May of that year. 29-year-old Paul Vivier was stabbed in the chest and died in hospital soon afterwards. A 38-year-old Denae Terry Bernard was also one of the three suspects arrested by Thunder Bay Police and charged with second-degree murder for their role in the Vivier's death. Bernard appeared in court yesterday and pleaded guilty to the lesser charge of manslaughter. The court heard it was Bernard who carried out the stabbing after the three suspects asked Vivier about the money, re money related to the drug debt. Bernard will be back in court for sentencing on April 6. Another one of the accused, a Toronto youth who was 16 at the time, pleaded guilty to manslaughter this summer and was released due to the time served. A third suspect, 21-year-old Sean D. Clark Noel of Whitby, will make his next court appearance later this month. Tragedy has struck a remote First Nation community as COVID-19 continues to take its toll. The loss of three members in Casabonica Lake has been confirmed by leaders with the Anishinaabeaski Nation. Nan posted to social media offering condolences to the community that currently has the highest number of positive cases in Nan territory. Active cases in Casabonica reached as high as 120 on Monday before dropping to 86 overnight. Casabonica's COVID cases are overseen by the Sioux Lookout First Nations Health Authority. That agency is reporting 446 active cases across more than 20 communities. Meanwhile, the Northwestern Health Unit continues to see high positivity rates at more than 26% as of Monday. Medical Officer of Health Dr. Kit Young-Hoon is worried that may rise with yesterday's loosening of provincial would, restrictions. It definitely, we will be monitoring all the statistics very closely with the lifting of restrictions today. Um, so uh, I think this may have an impact, but it's hard to see. We are a geography of um, lower population density. Medical officers of health in Ontario are no longer allowed to issue letters of instruction to organizations or businesses. The number of COVID-19 patients at the Regional Health Science Centre has fallen sharply since yesterday. There are now 34 COVID-positive patients inside the hospital, down from 45 on Monday. And the number of those patients in intensive care has dipped from 8 to 6. Overall hospital occupancy is now at 105% and ICU occupancy is nearly 91%. About 1,400 COVID-19 vaccines were administered last week across the Thunder Bay District Health Unit's catchment area. That's about 300 fewer than the week before. More than 800 of the shots last week were third doses and just over 100 people received their first dose. According to the Ministry of Health, 89% of people 5 and up across the district have now gotten at least one shot and nearly 85% have at least two doses. 
The new rules for crossing the border into Canada took effect yesterday, but officials at Grand Portage Lodge and Casino say the changes really won't make it much easier for Canadian travelers to take the short trip to the American side. Mitchell Ringos has the details. Fully vaccinated Canadians looking to visit the U.S. now only require proof of a negative antigen test taken less than 24 hours before arriving at the border instead of a PCR test. However, that rapid test must be administered by a U.S. lab, pharmacy or health facility, meaning at-home test kits could not be used to enter Canada. Rapid tests are a lot cheaper than the $200 PCR tests previously required. Brian Sherburn at Grand Portage Lodge and Casino says they wish Canada would do away with the testing requirements altogether and just ask for proof of vaccination. The small clinic in Grand Portage has capacity to analyze only 15 tests a day on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, so Canadians would still go to Duluth to get tested. You know, realistically, I don't know how much of a difference that makes unless someone is having to pay for a test. The tests that we have available here at Grand Portage are, are no charge, but again, we're limited to 15 tests. Sherburn says they're still getting some Canadians to come down to the lodge and casino by using those limited number of tests at their clinic. And he says the community has begun looking for ways to expand their COVID testing options. Now, we have been working on getting a testing company to be on site here, and that hasn't um, been all worked out at this point, but it is our hope to at one point have a, a testing site located on property. Sherburn says above all else, he just wants to get back to normal as everyone is tired of the current situation. And it's not just the fact they're missing the Canadian customers coming down, the folks in Grand Portage also miss coming up to Canada. Everyone's tired of this. We all want to get back to normal. Like I said, you know, we, we also miss coming up and going grocery shopping and going to restaurants. And, and we want to get back to where our relationships were before, where we're both able to go back and forth freely and get back to a, a day without having all these restrictions in place. Mitchell Ringo's TBT News. A major step today in Ontario's COVID-19 recovery plan, most restrictions in the province have now been lifted, including the requirements to show a vaccine passport. Masking will remain for now, however. Colin DeMillo has more on that and on when provincial employees will return to the workplace. It's the beginning of a new COVID chapter in Ontario, one that pushes the province beyond many of the pandemic measures that have been a mainstay over the last two years. Beginning today, capacity limits in all settings have been lifted, and the proof of vaccination requirements are also no longer mandatory. A welcome change to many after two long years. As long as the authorities feel the health care system can, uh, can move forward and not be, um, not be over, overwhelmed, Unless you go to you know, places where you're packed in like sardines with strangers, normal precautions uh, will do. Next, the province is eyeing the end of the mandatory masking policy, which could be lifted sometime this month. I expect that uh, that will probably be within the next few weeks based on the uh, scientific evidence that we get from Dr. Moore. And then, on April 1st, Ontario's 60,000 civil servants will have to return to work for a minimum of three days as the province looks to set an example for other employers. I think at this point, though, moving forward in a careful way, in a staged way, still preserving some options, including hybrid options, is the way to go. But is Ontario ready for all of this change? Some infectious diseases specialists believe so. We'll likely not necessarily see a big rise secondary to this. And, and that's good. You know, I, I think, again, most people have been vaccinated. There's a large amount of immunity that's gone through the population because of Omicron. And so we are a very different place than we were at the beginning of the Omicron wave. But while Ontario is moving forward, thousands of Ontarians are still dealing with the impacts of the pandemic. By some estimates, there are more than a million people waiting for surgeries that are still backlogged. And political parties are calling for a plan. Just imagine being one of those patients waiting and wondering why their government doesn't care about the fact that their health is deteriorating. Today, the health minister could not provide hard numbers on how many surgeries are actually backlogged.
but sketched out a rough timeline. It'll depend on the numbers that we finally receive, but we're not looking at years. We're looking at uh, shorter time frames for that. Now the government is being pressed to spend more to speed up the health care recovery. That was CTV's Colin DeMello. The Fort William Rotary Club is once again hosting its annual house lottery. Tickets are already being sold on a four-bedroom home valued at nearly three-quarters of a million dollars. The 36th edition of the lottery features this home in Sherwood Estates, located at 118 Dogwood Crescent. The four-bedroom, three-bathroom, two-story home features large triple-glazed windows throughout with an electric fireplace and a roughed-in sauna. The Rotary Club has already sold more than 10% of the tickets. In-person viewings are allowed once again on Sundays from 1 to 4. I think it's very exciting to come and look at what you might possibly win. Uh, it's also just uh, a really neat opportunity to see some of the beautiful work that uh, local contractors uh, do in our community um, to provide these gorgeous homes. And also just to kind of, it, it's a bit of a social occasion. We get to come out, we get to see, we get to participate, um, and then know that you, what, you're, what you're possibly winning. Tickets can be purchased on the Fort William Rotary's website or by calling the Rotary Club. A portion of sales go to local charitable initiatives. More than half a million dollars was raised for charity last year. Cambrian Players is getting ready to present its newest production. Vanya and Sonia, Masha and Spike is a comedy. And the amateur theatre group is hoping to leave audiences feeling good after the difficulty of the pandemic. You are just so luminous and full of youthful hope and energy. And I wonder if it makes it hard for older people to be around you. What? <laughs> the show focuses on two siblings who live together named Sonia and Vanya, whose lives are changed after their movie star sister, Masha, comes home with a younger boyfriend. The show is recommended for ages 14 and up and will have a capacity limit of 75% at the theatre on Spring Street. Lauren Payette will be playing the role of Sonia. She says the entire cast is looking forward to performing in front of a live audience. We are dying of excitement. Um, this rehearsal process itself has been exciting. Being able to rehearse live with actual human beings in the room has been incredible. So I can't even imagine how incredible it's going to be to have a whole room full of people to enjoy this with us. But God, I'm excited to do it. I wanted to pick a show, especially right now, the world's really heavy and we're going through a lot. And I wanted to um, offer Thunder Bay a chance to come out and have a really good night and leave smiling. The show opens tomorrow evening and continues each night until Saturday, with four more shows next week. Anyone interested can visit the Cambrian Players website to find out how to get tickets. Very curious to find out.